in the hymn. Rejoice, rejoice. The little boy just would not stop breaking into a broad smile. And it was just driving her nuts. So she finally told him, look, if you don't stop doing that, I'm going to have to tell your mother that you can't sing with the choir this Sunday or for Christmas. And then the little boy burst into tears, and from then on, there was no more smiling during that line of the hymn. And the choir director said, that's much better. We can't have that foolish smiling when we're singing and rejoice. <laughs> Now we laugh, but there's something to that joke. We've been having a very interesting Sunday School discussion for the last three Sundays about the evolution of the 1979 prayer book and how it really came to be and how it is so substantially different from the 28 prayer book that preceded it and some of the theological differences, but also the differences in what that prayer book has to say about who we are as a church, how we worship and live together as a community. And there's a lot in there. Those of you who have been in the church long enough to remember the 28 prayer book know that it offered just a single liturgy a liturgy that's quite similar to what we now call Rite 1. In fact, it's the, the liturgy that we're using for these four Sundays of Advent for every service. There was one service of baptism, one service of Holy Communion, one service of morning prayer, of evening prayer. You get the idea. And every church and every individual that called themselves Episcopalian would use this one service. And that had actually been the tradition for decades and centuries before as well. The 1928 prayer book had been a revision of previous iterations, but arguably not a gigantic revision. But then came the 1976 General Convention of the Episcopal Church, where a new prayer book was authorized. And by 1979, we had ratified the prayer book that we now use. And everything changed. Because now, there are, even within the prayer book, and by now the church is using a number of other experimental liturgies on top of what's in there, there were six different options for the Holy Eucharist. We've got right one, which is the more traditional language, but there's two options we can use within there. And then we've got right two, which is the more contemporary language. And there's four options that we can use in there. And those four options we explored in some detail this morning. And there's some hidden things behind the words. Prayer A, for example, the one that we often use through the green season, the ordinary time, is about the closest replica you're going to find of the old prayers, but it's modernized language. Prayer B is one that speaks very heavily about the incarnation of Christ. So it is very much geared towards seasons such as Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany. Now, Prayer C has a completely different tone to it. Prayer C never could have even existed in 1928 because it sounds a little bit like a Billy Graham Protestant revival from the 60s or the 70s. It speaks much more about our personal sinfulness our personal need for Christ's sacrifice on the cross, and a very personal relationship with Jesus. It's very much more of a modern-day Protestant kind of prayer. And then prayer D actually is arguably the most ancient one of all, even though the language might sound modern, because it harkens back to our more Eastern Orthodox Christianity. It sounds a lot more, at least theologically, like the kind of prayer you would get in a place like Athens or Constantinople. Now, what does this all mean? What it means is that in 1976 and beyond, the Episcopal Church made a conscious decision to say, you know, our church and our society have become much more diverse, one might say even much more fragmented, and therefore is in need of a much larger number of points of entry if we're going to seek to have any sort of 
unified Christian community. What speaks to one doesn't speak to the other, but somehow or another we still want to have a community and a worship that at least in some way speaks to everybody and gives everybody a sense of access to the divine and access to the community that's gathered in Christ's name. And so we're going to offer this multiplicity of ways to worship God. Now we all know that even though that was done with the best of intentions, and one could argue that in some ways it accomplished the goal it set out to, it also had some unintended, very negative consequences. People reacted very poorly to this in some corners of the church. To this day, we have Anglican churches that parted company with the Episcopal Church at that point in history and still adhere to the 1928 prayer book. There's one right here in Livermore, as a matter of fact. And it was a very schismatic time in the church. One could argue that perhaps we're, we're going through another one for similar reasons right now. So what is the answer? That is a very good question, and I can't give you a simple answer to it. But I would note something in today's gospel that relates very closely to all of this. When John's disciple went to Jesus and said, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Rather than giving a simple yes or no answer to that question, Jesus rather rehearsed what he was doing. He said, okay, let's have a look at this and see what you think. When the blind come, they see. When the deaf come, they hear. When the lame come, they walk. When the, I appear in the presence of the dead, they are raised. The poor have good news brought to them. Does that sound like the Messiah to you? And John's disciples pretty much said, Yep, that, that, that pretty much nailed it. <laughs> so, when the Messiah shows up, that's the character of things. The blind gain their sight, the deaf gain their hearing, the lame gain the ability to walk, the poor have good news brought to them. That's what it looks like for Jesus to show up in our world and in our midst. Now, people who are literally blind, or deaf, or lame, are obviously fairly easy to identify. But I'm going to suggest that the scripture always also has a more allegorical meaning to it. There are some far less easy to identify forms of blindness, or deafness, or lameness. And there is not a single one of us in this space who hasn't experienced one or more of those forms. I would say you probably don't know the person sitting next to you terribly well. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way at all. But everybody in this space is carrying something. There are those who have engaged in a heroic struggle with mental illness and perhaps are continuing to do so. There are those who have fought for decades to beat an addiction. And the list goes on and on, and you can't tell by looking at somebody. But where it comes out is in the words and the affect and the behavior and especially in something so important and so intimate as the way we worship God, it comes out. And so that's where you get the tremendous diversity that you find here in these pews. You will get one person for whom the worship of God is a very quiet, solemn exercise, and honestly, they would probably appreciate a great deal more silence than our worship affords them. You get others who can barely contain their cries of hallelujah, and who are going to be that little boy who foolishly smiles when we sing rejoice in Ocon Emmanuel. But what I would invite you to remember is that comes from somewhere. Somewhere deep inside that person, deep inside their soul, there is a joy or a fear or a hurt that needs to be touched by God. And 
walk, to give the dead their life back again, and to bring good news to the poor. And that person sitting next to you is, I guarantee you, at least one of those things, even if you can't tell. And however they need to worship, that is how they need to encounter the Messiah and to have the good news brought to them. So, yes, I know it's a little bit maddening. It's a little bit maddening to have six, ten, twenty, probably hundreds at this point of forms of worship, even in the book, let alone the way people actually choose to express them when they have fleshed them in their voices and their bodies. But that's what it means to be Christian community and to be gathered around this Messiah who answered John's disciples in the way they did. So St. Bart's, don't get me wrong, I'm not criticizing you. I think we already do a wonderful job of this. But I'm just saying that on this 